Welcome to Audio Gyan with Kedar Nimkar, a podcast that documents insightful conversations with Indian designers, artists, musicians, writers, thinkers, and creatives of all types. Catch us on iTunes or visit audiogyan.com for more Gyan sessions. Here's your host, Kedar Nimkar. Today I have Hari Katrakada with us on Audio Gyan. Hari is a Mumbai-based photographer and a painter who explores communities. environment and personal memories he he uses long term documentary approach which is very new to me uh, he works with alternative photographic methods to incorporate found materials in images he graduated with masters degree from university of texas at austin and started his career as a photojournalist in new delhi today we are here to know more about his work practice his philosophy and most importantly how he has recourse his work for social change So thank you Hari for giving your time and it's a real pleasure to have you on audio again. Thank you very much for inviting me for this. Yeah so frankly I'll just set some disclaimer I'm completely like under confident to ask you any questions because I'm not like not a domain expert in the kind of work you're doing but uh, just a just a quest to understand your philosophy and uh, also this audio again is mainly to do some brain pickings and and uh, understand aspects of your work. Sure. Yeah. So um can you start by giving some context as to how do you define your work of painting what what style is it i mean any uh, were there any earlier influences or uh, any other legends who have worked in sino type work or what what style of abstract painting it is so i have two different practices one is uh, i would broadly classify it as drawing and other one is photography which has cyanotypes and alternative photographic methods so in drawing i would i started as a child uh, as a cartoonist i used to publish cartoons in telugu magazines but somewhere down the line i got into academics and completely gave that line up but um, i did pick up that thread eventually because i was still interested in drawing uh, and painting so i my earliest memory of uh, art which really influenced me was painter called ram kumar he's still alive uh, based in delhi uh, so when i saw his pictures of uh, paintings of uh, banaras uh, which he painted in 50s and 60s uh, that was something like a you know a goosebump moment for me and i i'd been to banaras in 70s uh, mid late 70s and those images kind of were very evocative for me so So, and so that was the time when i first realized the power of paintings then when i moved to chennai to study engineering there i hung out with a lot of artists and spent time to understand what painting is all about and learned something uh, from just hanging around with artists walking on the streets sketching with my friends things like that so there i discovered this great artist called paul klee uh again that was like a revelation for me because i'd i'd seen art in magazines and uh, maybe newspapers but nothing like that you know there's something which was beyond representation mm. this is about the world of ideas philosophy um uh, inner worlds mostly inner worlds which we don't necessarily see it out in the open and then um another artist called romit mandal again his lines were very uh, gritty stark and his images were f- dark dark as in like very disturbing nightmarish uh, very existential angst that kind of a uh, imagery he had so again these were completely n- new things for me like i'd never seen work like that i'd seen a bit of hussein but uh, they didn't interest me that much but robin mandel and paul klee were like really really important when i just started getting exposure to art sorry but when you were like developing this craft what what were the type of paintings you were making these were general sketches or or were there inclination of these uh, artists so in the beginning i used to just walk in madras uh, on the streets with a sketchbook and then just okay. just draw people hmm. so since i was also al- already into uh, drawing cartoons it was not a big problem for me to transition to actual proper figurative drawings but then when i saw these artists then uh, it was just uh, 
a way different way of looking at the world like you don't necessarily have to represent the world directly as you see it but it can be incorporated with your thoughts like it was much more personal approach to making drawings mm -hmm. which means like suppose you and i see a person or a, a scenery we would be seeing the same thing but we would be evoking something completely different it's because you know we as uh, two people are coming from a different place we have our own emotional histories personal histories our education the place you're coming from everything kind of comes out so the work shows these differences so th that really interested me more than just uh, figurative drawings mm -hmm. so um, then um, i went to austin to study and then i moved to new york there from there then i saw this artist called jean michel basquiat who was a street graffiti who kind of started as a graffiti artist but he never called himself a graffiti artist um let's call him an artist but he was uh, an absolute phenomenon in 80s and he died pretty young um uh, so he combined uh, street art or graffiti style with uh, a lot of conceptual ideas but he incorporated ideas of racism uh, what is it to be black in america uh, violence and then he incorporated a lot of text he was also very much interested in poetry literature and music so he got all these elements into his work and then when he when his work exploded on the streets then uh, people took notice to you know who is this guy you know and he used to call himself semo as in same old shit so anyway so um, i saw this huge retrospective of uh, basquiat's work in uh, Brooklyn Museum in 2006 and oh uh, man that was something again a, a life changing life changing event for me so basquiat was a huge huge influence um and then uh, later when i moved back to india then i started discovering indian artists you know uh, who were influenced by uh, both indian philosophy or eastern philosophy like zen but also they were also very much exposed to the western art history so for example gaiton day <clears throat> an absolutely great artist uh so gaiton day's work again has a very minimalist feel so this is not figurative at all it's very very uh, zen inspired very reflective um it's something which takes you inside like inner worlds so gaiton day was like huge for me and then um, then i met this artist based in new york called zarina hashmi she's a a printmaker in a way but she she her work is again minimalist but uses a lot of text um very very beautiful work mm. um then a printmaker called krishna reddy again based in new york um absolutely stunning work so these are the uh, artists who made very quite different works you know they and their themes were quite interesting but very personal so that was something which i i th th that's a take away from me you know from these artists who were saying things which were very very deeply personal yet evoking something very universal in uh, in the viewer mm -hmm. so that's that's how i would trace my journey yeah uh, but that's on the painting side of it so yes. um, your your work at least what i have seen in terms of photography also it it tries to capture the same essence or I don't know so can you can you speak more about it Yeah so if you look at photography then my first influence was Raghurai um which uh, I I I guess no Indian photographer can really escape because he's like he's he's a towering figure in Indian photography absolutely very influential and then um, the the godfather of photography street photography Cartier Bresson so uh, these were the ones uh, I was again I always I never knew about photography's power until I saw their work you know they could look at a scene which everybody would look at but they would capture on a moment which we would all miss so that uh, that's a sense which you get you know something which is very momentary ephemeral they could they could catch that so Bresson and uh, Raghurai were very very important to uh, important points in my in the beginning of my photography career and then um, once i moved to uh, something beyond again capturing the streets so that came from a photographer called robert frank american photographer 
uh, again his work again uh, is he do his shooting streets and you know life on the streets and things like that his work is extremely deeply personal so again um, his readings and his poetry and everything comes out in his photographs so 10 people looking at the same scene robert frank would come up with like a completely different interpretation of it so this rather than just capturing what is in front of your eye it's about interpreting a scene that's the thing which i learned from robert frank and then um, there's a photographer called joseph kodelka a czechoslovakian photographer uh, again he shot i mean his whole life work a majority of his life work is on gypsies the romas again his work is not just documenting gypsies how they live and stuff like that it's very psychological it's very deeply interior and very personal yet it's about them mm-hmm. so he's an outsider but yet he's trying to capture something about a community which is ostracized uh, stigmatized yet he's got this very compassionate and empathetic guy so there are things which uh, you learn from everybody and Correct. that's what i learned from kodelka and robert frank is again very deeply poetic mm-hmm. so yeah so if i see a common ground between my art practice and photography it would be that your expression uh it's about expressing something which is deep inside through any medium so it it could be writing or photography or drawing or painting for me it's about you know going deep inside and trying to search for something and then coming out with some expression mm-hmm. so it's so medium is just it it could it's just photography or paper or drawing or whatever mm-hmm. so that's the way i see it cool and and when you say uh, it's personal work i want to understand what do you mean by that because uh, it's it's finally every piece of art is like a expression of oneself within right so does it resonate with lot of people and then it catches like a mass appeal or it still remain personal so how, like what are the what right are the so for example um, i would separate commercial work for example an advertising photographer for example has to please the client so there's a brand which he has to okay. sell it that's where you come okay so let's a soap or whatever so he has to sell it right so that's a commercial photographer it, so even though you have a style which is like you know for example uh, atul kasbeker or somebody like that would have a certain style of shooting it richard avedon or helmet newton all these guys have a certain style but if they say you know i want to sell this soap then um, yeah like you know you will shoot in the way you can or the way you normally would that's how you are hired for but then you have to your your vision has to be like you know in resonance with the client mm. when it comes to personal work it really doesn't matter you know who uh, approves your work or who doesn't approve your work it that's really secondary it's it's really uh, to a point of irrelevance so you do it because you know you can't live without <laughs> doing it no but then how like you put out in a exhibition and then how does it catch that that uh, resonance with the people so there is a saying that the more personal your work gets the more universal it will become so it's very paradoxical in a way you know like you know why would anybody care about what my concerns are my obsessions are but it's 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 a very paradoxical thing the more uh, you try to please audience the f- lesser it will somehow reach them the more you try to go be honest and be authentic i think the authenticity is the crucial thing in this mm-hmm. so the more authentic you are to your own uh, self some of people get that so it's it's it is uh, it's a very hard idea to wrap around your head mm-hmm. because why would anybody care about you know your history or whatever yeah, okay. but somehow it does so that's that's a thing yeah in fact um, i know it's paradoxical and a lot of people might might find it difficult to comprehend also but i would just like to add to that uh, because i'm 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 trying to read some scriptures uh, indian scriptures and obviously buddha doesn't uh, matlab he's he's the mainstream guy so uh, in his he said like we say that buddha is all knowing so actually what he's knowing is the center of the truth or the 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 deepest truth within himself mm-hmm. so that's why he's all knowing as well he doesn't know like what time the like the dadar train is going to leave so yeah. how does it qualify that he's all knowing but he knows the one point 
from where everything stems up mm-hmm. so that's where it resonates with me what you said ki if you become more personal so you go deeper inside it then it will appeal to a larger audience so, so yeah. somehow it's yeah i i yeah. you know uh, it's i would again say the same thing as somehow if the more centered you are somehow mm-hmm. you can you know have a clarity of vision which uh, i guess is another way of saying it yeah yeah um so um like how did sinotype evolve i mean what was the process of that and then was it through the types of painting you were trying to uh, uh, discover explore or was it sinotype which made you land into the type of paintings you are working on um no the sinotype work completely came uh, from my experience as a photographer i learned photography entirely um, by experimenting with film and chemicals and so i'm the last generation of photographers who actually uh, dirty the hands with the chemicals and uh, process the film and made my own prints in the dark room but once the digital came you know in the last 15 years um, the film pretty much vanished from the scene it's there's a revival now but so i've been away from this uh, hands on approach with photography now it's all computers and photoshop and digital cameras but somehow i wanted to get back to that because the there is a there's a there, there's a deep satisfaction in actually seeing a print emerge in a dark room like you know you don't when you shoot on a film it's entirely it's a very blind game like you don't know whether you actually got the right image on the film or not until you process the film and make the print in the dark room it emerges and that magic always stays with you so that's um that, that's something which you know you'll you'll, you'll take it to your grave hmm. which unfortunately the digital doesn't have you the moment you shoot it you on your lcd panel behind you already know what you got so the mystery is gone so that mystery part which the traditional photography which is analog process the chemical based process has the digital somehow has lost it um once i heard about alternative photography methods which is cyanotype is one of the earliest photography method which was invented right around the silver halide based photography the traditional black and white photography this is like more than 140 years 150 years back so i wanted to explore uh, this method which was first a it was the cheapest it's very cheap and it's also and the, the most interesting part is it can be made in daylight so it's actually cyanotype is also a process based using sunlight it's a chemical reaction which happens inside the chemical uh, on the paper uh, entirely due to the ultraviolet component of the sunlight mm. so it's also called a sun print for example so it so architects had these blueprints before xerox machines and everything 100 years back they used to make blueprints I, i'm sure like there still might be somebody making blueprints in architecture mm. so they were basically cyanotypes okay. so you you and cyanotypes is a process where you make um uh, a transparent medium on which you can draw or have an image any kind of image and you place it on a chemically coated paper which is sensitive to uv radiation and put it in sunlight that's it so it's as simple as that so this is like a you know you know it's something which even a um uh, child will enjoy mm-hmm. as a school kid would you know enjoy i learned this process and then i was wondering you know um uh, this is a process not invented by indians obviously it's a british uh, scientist herschel was the one who invented this process and 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 the process uses chemicals uh, with distilled water you know it's like proper you need, you need like a setup for this but i know it's very difficult to source all these things like the water is not distilled water most of the time you will probably use uh, battery water which is demineralized water and you don't know if it's contaminated or not a lot of issues sourcing right chemicals in india mm-hmm. uh, and i thought like you know then it's this idea sparked that if i'm not sure about the water which i'm going to use for this process if it's really pure water distilled water or contaminated what if i actually turn it around and use it deliberately so how about using this process itself as a glitch glitch is a starting point of my process then i it, it just struck me that you know maybe if i use contaminated water from rivers then i'm actually incorporating that pollution 
into my process and it's a statement on the pollution itself and also subverting the process which is not indian so I, you know it's a wow. it, it's a, it's a it's a um it, it's a perverse pleasure in a in a way to subvert uh, mm. a colonial process mm. but anyway so that's uh, how i started cyanotype uh, to make prints with uh contaminated water and i started with meethi river in bombay but eventually i wanted to work on a larger project so i went to uh banaras and kanpur to make more prints there and 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 we know that ganga is one of the most polluted rivers and there's a lot of political baggage attached to it and uh, there's all spiritual aspect to it there's a religious aspect to it it's a, it's a it's one of the most important rivers in the world uh, but it also extremely polluted and uh, about 450 million indians actually survive on the water coming from the ganges so yeah so it's a, it's a very important issue a lot of people have documented this issue but never uh, with this process so for me number one was that it uh, i didn't want to document the pollution with the you know in a usual way of photographing you know a contamination site like a factory um, releasing a lot of chemicals or sewage coming into the river these things i mean it's been done many many times and, and i'm sure like you know people have seen it and people also ignore it because we've seen it many times we are kind of numb to this so this for me uh, is a way of saying the same thing in a very different way so that you know okay so at least somebody is going to pay attention to okay this is i don't know so it's like first you don't know what what the hell is this you know so first the process itself is like alien to most of the people including me so for me it was interesting enough to actually go ahead with this process second <clears throat> I also got interested in incorporating materials in photo in in photography as in when I make print rather than just have an image on it I also wanted to have uh found materials so when I say found materials when I go to a contaminated site found materials are either organic pollutants chemi- you know chemicals or even materials like plastic for example <clears throat> so this is another way of incorporating those uh contaminants into the print making process and also being making it a part of the print so for example i use chemicals or plastic or uh any inorganic substances on the print itself so that makes my photograph so i'm not just talking about a f- image on the on the surface but i'm also talking about the surface itself how the surface itself can be contaminated in a way the way a skin is contaminated by pollutants by from the river i want the photograph to be contaminated by these pollutants so in a way it's really evoking uh what happens to our skin mm-hmm. and then transferring it the same process to the photograph what happens to the photograph when it is contaminated by uh pollution yeah so that's so yeah so this was the i mean it's a long way of saying you know this is how i got into cyanotype but um so so i'll cut you here because uh, um So my next question was actually about that the uh, in one of your interviews you mentioned art as like a inner exploration as well as way to address social concerns. Right. So this clearly ties up to that uh, one. But what I want to ask you is that uh, do you explicitly make a point that people should understand first the basic method of cyanotype and what the actual rendition would be if distilled water is used mm-hmm. and now that you are not using what sort of uh, changes or what sort of evolution happens in your painting itself so is there a before after kind of a thing or it just uh, now it's just art and then there is this subtext to it yeah i didn't want it to be like a scientific comparison at all because mm. you know then uh, i i i since I, i i'm interested in science but i didn't want this to be scientific uh, way of approaching pollution at all i wanted to be very evocative about uh, i mean you can give data to people like endless like you can write books about it and you know nobody would be moved by it mm. but no but this is very i would say based yeah, in no no the 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 type of photograph i have not seen it physically but at least what i've seen online it it is i wouldn't say disturbing but it seems different yeah. right now what is different in it you need to have you need to tell the audience also right yeah 
So how does that happen? Right. So these uh, cyanotype prints, it's called cyanotype because it's cyan, the, the color cyan, which is like actually the correct color, the official color is Prussian blue, which is what cyanotypes look like. Once you add contaminants to, into it, then it becomes anything. It could be any, it can turn into any other color. It could be uh, brownish, it could be... So depending on the chemical. Chemical, yeah. So if I add uh, some garbage, it would be just like, you know, a diluted version of it. But if I add phosphates or uh, if I add bleaching agents, for example, in Kanpur, the tanneries release a lot of chromium, hexavalent chromium, which is carcinogenic. And these these chemicals are used to bleach animal skins. So if I bleach cyanotype print with these chemicals obviously the print would be bleached out so you'd wonder like you know what am i you know what am i looking at so i want you know imagery to be interesting enough so that people want to look at it once they look at it they they should wonder like what what is going on so and rather than it, you initiate dialogue that's yes all, yeah. i don't want people to be passive spectators which is what happens when you look at a, norm, a photograph of a contaminating factory Okay, they know what it is. So they figure out everything and then they move on. But I don't want people to move on. I want people to like think about what's going on. So that, you know, that, that back and forth dialogue between the print and the viewer is very important for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thought this might, you know, be one way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. And that's how like uh, Effluence was uh, like a series of, uh, uh, like Effluence was your one of the projects, right? Right. So uh, like, can you can you give us a brief about it as well? Right. So um, basically, this series I started with Meathi River in Bombay. Again, it's uh, it is very contaminated with all chemicals and poly, uh, plastic and all kinds of organic and inorganic substances in it. And then I moved to uh, uh, Varanasi and Kanpur. And then I went to Kochi, uh, and there the water bodies I worked with uh, plastic there. So. Broadly speaking, this is about incorporating uh, pollution into the cyanotype image making process. Mm -hmm. So I, I have done with three rivers, but eventually I'll probably expand to more. Wow, wow, beautiful. Um, so the next one which I want to ask you has been my like age-old question with a lot of artists, uh, especially painters and illustrators. And the most recent, which I think will be releasing tomorrow, uh, I did with uh, like a very realistic painter, a, a realism angle wala painter. And this was the same question. To that, uh, Parag Borse is his name. And to that, he answered that uh, finally it's the intent with which you are drawing. it. So the question is basically when you're drawing, um, like what is what is important for you uh, in a painting or in a photography, uh, any, any of the canvas which you pick. Uh, style, medium, content, context, or like your personal journey itself. What what's what's dominant and what should be ideally dominant or what can be dominant or how does how do these uh, different aspects while creating an artwork interplay? Yeah. <clears throat> so. I would say, you know, they all, it's very hard to separate these things generally. Hmm. No, but there is a, any, any particular dominates, right? Some people are, now in this case, what I as a viewer can understand is that you're playing with the medium itself because you're playing with that matter, playing with that material. Now, the process itself, the process itself, right? Yeah. Now, aesthetically, it may take its own shape. Right. So you're not really bothered about that, right? right? While there are certain painters who are very, very particular, like Raja Ravi Varma, it would be very important with aesthetics. Right. right? So so how do these uh, interplay in, in your mind when you're working with... So when it comes to my art, uh, drawing, um, it <clears throat> for me, I, I really cannot separate there because once it's out of my hands... It's up to the viewer. You know, the viewer can really interpret in, entirely on their own way. So I might give a little title to it and I might use a certain medium. I mostly work with uh, uh, oil crayons, pastels. Um, and I use uh, newspapers as my medium. So these are, I mean, there's a very specific reason why I use them because of it's, it's again, there's a movement in art called Art Povera, Italian movement. Again, it's about using very cheap materials, but it's also the post-war Europe, which was 
you know, uh, gone through that war and uh, destitution in a way. Uh, they, they, it had a context to that. But it, for if you, like 50, 60 years down the line, it's broadly speaking about, you know, human condition in a way. It's about what's happening in society. Um, we have like things like how media is manipulated. So there are a lot of, so I don't really explicitly say all these things, you know, you, I don't have to say it, but it's about people who can, uh, p- people can take whatever they want, you know, you can question like, you know, why is it painted on newspaper? Why not on a good quality art paper? Why this medium? So these are the things once the viewer starts asking questions, the dialogue, you know, is established, a lot of interesting interpretations start coming out. So that's what I'm interested in. You know, the dialogue is more interesting than saying, this is my agenda, because I really don't have any agenda when I'm drawing. But when it comes to <clears throat> the work with cyanotypes, I um, I mean, I understand it's a, it's a, quite an important issue, you know, for a lot of people. Like, the pollution issue is not something, it's just about aesthetics. It's, it is something which affects people's lives. It affects our ecology, environment, and everything. So I make sure I give a lot of context with the uh, text al- along with the images. So that, yes, you know, people might be aesthetically interested in, you know, wondering, you know, what is this? But beyond that, I don't want it to be like, you know, a beautiful graphic image or a beautiful uh, aesthetically pleasing image. I mean, most of the time they're not aesthetically pleasing. They're quite disturbing in a way. Mm. But at the same time, they're not ugly. They are interesting, but they're not ugly. They're not beautiful. I would not say they're beautiful either. <clears throat> they're interesting. So that you would be interested in knowing more about it. And once you are curious to know more about it, you would, might want to read the caption. So in the caption, I give some data and uh, give a context to that. So that, you know, I want viewer to like not just take away the aesthetic part about it, which is for me is also interesting, you know, because photography, as we understand generally is about shooting a picture with the camera and printing it out and that's about it. But can we go beyond that? So this medium itself has a, you know, a century and a half history to it. So we can have a dialogue with the history of photography itself, how various methods of photography can be, you know, used to understand the world or express your ideas, your vision. And it's better if you also have a caption, especially especially for this, Mm -hmm. but you need not. Okay. But because this is an issue which affects us personally and uh, environmentally, I would lo- you know like people to actually take away the context also. Mm-hmm. When it comes to photography, um, I'm talking about like the straight traditional photography with yeah. camera. So I've done documentary photography and photojournalism. Again, those are you know very very uh, directed photojournalism. You want it's a it's a very clear intent there. You know, there is a... You want to communicate directly. Absolutely. There's an event which you want to, you know, say it as clearly as possible. And then as... You know, doesn't mean like, you know, the most boring way. You know, like... So, in the most interesting way. You can make it very visually uh, appealing and also intricate. But at the same time, you don't want to mislead. You want to have a point of view. At the same time, you want to communicate something. But that's very much about photography. Documentary photography, you know. But uh, photojournalism. But when it comes to cyanotypes, it's, I think, both aesthetics and a context. When it comes to my art, I, I think it's like really about, it's, it's really out there. It's, it's up to the viewer, what, whatever the viewer wants to take it from there. Mm-hmm. I, I never want viewer to go in one particular direction the way I'm thinking. It's no. Once it's out of my hands, it's, it's free for all. Wow. Superb. Um... I recently did one uh, interview with Prashant Godboli also and I asked him like some bits about uh, time and space and we are generally like having like sort of a trying to have a philosophical discussion. Um, So in this case, I want to ask you like you are a photographer and a painter, right? So now in photography, you try and capture that very um, as per at at least like as per Prashant's uh, thing was that you try and capture that particular moment in time. Right. So I want to ask you, like, what's your definition of patience? So again, um, in in photography, I would say patience is. Uh, I really work. I think in terms of uh, long term work. So when I say long term work, you 
you are interested in certain issue or a certain community or s- some aspect of the world out there or maybe it could be even in, in you know in a world you don't know uh, how to go about it you don't know how it will pan out but you have a hunch that there is something it might hold my attention so you start with that belief and faith that you know i i want to do this because i i first you're interested in that and you want to know more about it explore it in depth so i would say patience is about having that faith to carry on without any tangible end point in sight and believing that you know it might work out but it need not there is no guarantee so that living in uncertainty to me is patience like you know that extreme uncertainty by that you worked for years and it still might like you know come on flat nothing might work but generally but you need patience to live in uncertainty <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> it's not the other way around right so so how do you reconcile that because then you're building patience to live with that uncertainty as opposed to you have patience uh i you know i get what, it. Yeah. I, i know i know yeah so i would say meditation <laughs> <laughs> just meditate that you know things will uh things will be okay i think if if you if you if you're honest with yourself and being authentic things will work out that's i think uh, that belief is necessary i think if i i do believe that every artist has to have the belief mm-hmm. that uh, you put in your work as best as you can uh, things will work out yeah. but don't kill yourself if it doesn't you know there's another day yeah. that's don't be van gogh <laughs> <laughs> um so hari sir like i would like to ask like conclude with one last question uh, which i'm just trying to ask you so your expression um is abstract in nature from what i understood so do you find it difficult to so which medium do you think is more difficult to um uh, to explore abstract concepts is it like photography or is it painting and how do you how do you balance these two as well i would not entirely call my work abstract um mm-hmm. uh, neither it would fall under figurative as in like you know images which are very clear cut so uh, as far as my art is concerned it would be falling somewhere in between okay so so is there is there a terminology for it because i it's semi figurative or semi abstract or semi figurative in a way they are both okay. you know mean uh, pretty much the same thing um, abstract is like completely like you know uh, formless in a way you know it 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 basquiat's work type <laughs> basquiat is not abstract really it's more street work street photog- uh, street uh, uh, graffiti style so uh, there's a lot of cartoon drawing and it's there's a lot of line drawing in his work so basquiat's okay. work is pretty much relatable and as as in like you know you can see people's legs and hands and forms for example gaitonde's work um is very very abstract very um the, it's, it's literally formless in a way you know there's no tangible forms to hold on to he's not giving you any focal point to you know start Build exploring the, the work hmm. so that is that's why people find it very difficult to you know understand what is abstraction but again it's got its own language and its own history so you know it's like understanding a mathematician's work you know you just can't look at a formula and say oh i don't understand so it must be junk no <laughs> it has its own you know language to it right so you study that and you arrive at something similarly um so abstraction yeah it's it, it you know on the one end and the other end it's figuration you know like clear people and nature and animals and things like that but for me it's like the world of uh, um the inner worlds like you know the world of dreams for example a lot of things can be very fluid there they're not very clear cut at the same time they're not vague also that's the world which i'm interested in. you know it's like a suspended in between world um so i would say my art would be in that the state of dreams in a way mm-hmm. it could be surreal it could be very dreamy nightmarish whatever but it's not direct you know uh, direct representation of anything or it it's not entirely abstract either somewhere in the middle uh, when it comes to cyanotypes again it's like you know neither entire so you can make cyanotype prints with just a you know like let's say i have sunset or like you know a, a tree or a face of a person a portrait i can make a cyanotype print and look make it like a traditional black and white instead of black and white it would be like bluish 
it's got a bluish tinge to it that's all it would be that would be a traditional cyanotype hmm. once i start incorporating these pollutants then things become a little more interesting to me so it's no longer just a portrait it's no longer a very abstract image either it's somewhere in between so again it's it falls between it's semi abstract semi figurative mm-hmm. but my documentary photography or photojournalism would be i would say pretty much straightforward you know mm-hmm. it's 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 figurative mm-hmm. you know no but what i want to understand is uh, finally there is core inner expression which you want to make right now is that satisfied through painting or is that satisfied through um, cyanotype or general photography even mm. uh, when it comes to art i'm uh, yeah i will i mean i mean do these mediums all absolutely these mediums have their independent pros and cons but then what what takes you closer to your expression i would say uh, when it comes to photography it's really going uh, into the world you know like you need a camera you need an instrument to record something out in the world when it comes to drawing or painting it's really between you and your paper and and your colors you know and and so that's really very very close you know uh, i would say i like, hope i have not put you in a very uncomfortable position no no i'm just wondering you know what exactly is that which drives me so i would say like you know when it comes to uh, art it's it it, it, it is uh, really independent of uh, like you really can do it entirely you know by yourself hmm. when it comes to photography i do need the world in a way i by world i mean like places and people and objects, objects, and, objects and stuff yeah. like that here i really don't need so a happy a kind of a blend to these things is a photo book which i've also been doing for a while i'm using all these methods in the photo book making process so i'm using my drawings i'm using uh, uh in uh, incorporating materials on the images and straight photography so there is there's a uh something very interesting comes out when you put all these things together and do a proper sequencing of images and make it a give it a book form um it's again a very interesting form which i've been exploring for a while wow. so i would say it's a culmination of all these in- activities brilliant brilliant is the book out or is it coming it's a it's a maquet right now so i'm uh, hoping to publish it cool sometime cool. soon All right I think these are the questions which I could ask you or understand from your work um uh, if people have to collaborate or understand like any any exhibition which is coming up uh, like how do people connect with you what's the best way and any any uh, concluding tips you want to give to painters or fellow photographers or designers um I I I think just <laughs> keep at it and you know really believe in your in your work mm. and and just just daily practice i think that's the thing i would say yeah. and uh, regarding getting in touch about my work or anything like that would be my instagram mm. it's um, hari.katragadda um that's where i post uh, my work and any updates so cool, cool. sure cool thank you on that note uh, thanks a lot for giving your time it was real honor speaking to you and also quite an enriching experience thank you so much for inviting me for this thank you thank you thank you that's it and that's it from today's gyan session catch us on itunes savan stitcher or any podcasting app you use do rate us on itunes and follow us on twitter facebook and instagram stay tuned for more gyan on audiogyan.com till then bye